Connor Gill, welcome to the lockdown sessions. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Uh, a bit nervous, but I'm excited. Well, I want you to relax. And um, based on the fact that you've got up early in the morning, the day after your 18th birthday, is um, very impressive. Um, it would be if I actually slept last night. <laughs> so you've actually get any sleep up all the way through? Yeah, I haven't slept. I've had about three cups of coffee this morning. <laughs> and it's but it's cool. Enough. I'm awake. It's, it's all good. You're ready to go. Well, look, I invited you to come on to these sessions. One, because we've known each other a long time and I thought it would be really interesting to get the perspective of a team through lockdown. So I've had a lot of people come and talk to me about what it's like to live with their teams. <laughs> And I've had a lot of people talk about what it's like to have kids in the house and coaching and leadership topics. But what I've never actually had on the podcast is somebody who is a teen and is having to live through the most challenging time, I imagine, of their years when it comes oh, yeah. to all the restrictions. So, so my starter for 10 to get us going is how have you had to adapt, like just to being with your mates at home like what have you noticed about yourself now that we're like nearly 11 months into this well me and my friends we're not the most you know uh intelligent or uh, sophisticated group of people that you'll ever meet but um seeing as we're all you know when when this started we were all 16 and i've just turned 18 that's a bit mental so now that we're at the age where we're completely aware of what's going on, so it's kind of inspired a lot more, again, sophisticated, sophisticated discussions. And I think that has been good for us as a dynamic. But um, it's been tough because, you know, in, in the summer, we used to go out every day, play football for eight hours, come home, um, then just play together online um but now it's it's completely different you know we wake up do some school work um or for me just um just work um and then we see each other online anyway but it's 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 challenging because there's that a lack of physical interaction that really makes i don't know how it impacts uh people of like different ages but for my generation physical contact is essential yeah because you know we've we've grown up with the rise of technology but that doesn't make us you know value physical contact less than any other generation no actually that's a really good point it makes you more savvy and probably able to cope with the technical digital hyper connection that we now have and have to have because we're all at home but actually it doesn't mean because you have that ability, you've grown up in that tech world, that you don't then miss physically being around people. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's nice because with, with the technology that we have, we can still have almost a face-to-face -face discussion. You know, we can FaceTime, you know, we can have a Zoom call. Uh, like we've, we've made, I've made so many arrangements with so many different groups of people. Like Sunday nights, I have, a Zoom call with some of my London friends. Uh, Friday nights, I have a Zoom call with like two different groups and we just play some games. Um, I've got a Zoom call with the cousins now. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's nice to almost have a face-to-face -face discussion, but like so a lot of the time, a one-on-one -on -one in-person discussion just isn't the same. No, I hear you. And, and I'm sure it is different generationally, but for most of us, we're human beings, Connor, right? I mean, we want to connect with people. So I'm hearing people from the age of five to the age of 95 all saying, I miss hugging my family. And not the people we live awful. with. Right, you know? Hugging well, I, I haven't had physical contact with someone that I don't live with for months now. It's mental. And, you know, we've talked in the past, right, how, especially as someone young growing up, it's having those things to look forward to that were really important. So 
when you were just sharing that, you know, how difficult it's been, it makes me then think like for you and your friends, how do you cope with the, the mental health challenge of these restrictions? Cause our, some of you must be suffering, right? Just statistically. I mean, it's, it's a bit weird because me personally, <laughs> I'm the happiest I've ever been at the moment. Right, you love it. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon with that. I'm, it, I don't think it's got anything to do with lockdown. I think it's just um, my own confidence has just risen. But seeing people around me, I can see that their mental health has visibly taken a dip and it goes up and down and up and down. I think it has a, a very strong connection to the feeling of I'm doing the same thing every single day over and over again for almost a year now like that gets so tedious and sometimes you know you wake up in a naturally good mood it could stay that way or it could just you know diminish throughout the day or you could just wake up in a terrible mood and it could last like that for weeks or even months yeah and obviously I've, I've had my my strings with mental health throughout lockdown because of the the lack of physical contact like i i I saw a friend yesterday, he dropped off a present for my birthday. Couldn't shake his hand, couldn't give him a hug. And it's just, it was obviously nice to see him and I really appreciated the gesture. But without that kind of, you know, thank you, mate, here's a hug. I appreciate that. Yeah. It kind of doesn't feel like we've had a proper interaction. It's like I've seen him, I've said, hello, thank you. Doesn't seem genuine enough to me. I, I know people who's are having conversations with their parents, older parents, so people my age, right, thinking and talking about their parents, where their parents don't want to see them because they won't be able to hug. It all yeah, we've had the same issue with, with uh, grandma, because I haven't hugged grandma since, you know, the pandemic started. And you know, obviously, I'm, I'm really close to grandma. And, um, you know, it's, it's the same, if not worse, for mum. Yeah, right. And, and I think, you know, there's this, I, I can't believe, you know, when I look back, I, I spent three months driving to my parents' flat uh, and sitting in the basement stairwell of their flat while they kind of stood on the balcony with masks on, talking yeah. to me 20 minutes, you know, with Rocky. Yeah, we've had a similar situation, you know, we've gone into, um, you know, grandma's back garden and I've had a conversation with her, but obviously... We can't use any of her garden furniture, so we've got to sit on the the wall while she sits on a on a lovely little chair and yeah. with a nice cup of tea. And we're we're on the grass. Our grass is off. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's cold at the moment, so you know we're we're going to see our our friends and family. Can't go inside. You know, can't really share their crockery, their cutlery. So we're shivering in the cold. <laughs> talking trying to make the most of a bad situation <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah well you you say it true uh i mean actually i think you absolutely say it as it is um and yet it's interesting isn't it because a lot of the things you've talked about there make me think that winter lockdown is much more difficult than summer lockdown yeah 100 percent do you and your mates, do you actually talk about the struggles or do you just like have to pick up on each other? It depends. If someone is like going through a struggle, we'll acknowledge it. We'll give them a bit of space because obviously, you know, boys will be boys. We take the piss. <laughs> we'll acknowledge it. We'll give it a bit of space and um, you know, they can talk about it if and when they're ready. And, you know, it might not be to everyone. Or it might be to individuals. Of course, we're boys, so it gets around anyway. But um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I mean, we sort of just give each other the time and space that we need, whilst also making sure that everyone else knows what's going on. It's interesting, isn't it? Because boys often get a bad press in the um, sort of very sort of stereotypical way that boys don't talk about yeah. stuff. Um, I mean, a, a lot of that is true, though. Right. Because I, I believe that you know compartmentalization is innate in our genetics because we I, I see it so so often it can't just be a thing that boys do because they want to it's got to be something within the gene pool 
you know, like a like a recessant or dominant gene. Or could it be that psychologically we are trained to be strong and not show weakness? It's almost. I it's think that that's primal. definitely part of the part of the very sexist undertone, which isn't something that you hear when we're talking about, you know, the male gender nowadays. Right. And, and we're moving into a space here where I'm still, you know, educated every day on it. Um, so I quite like the phrase you used when you said that you give those people sort of space. Um, how do adults, how, how can adults best support young people who aren't, always able to express, say, to those adults what is going on. Because when you're mates, you, you you have a way, don't you, of talking with each other where you can say little but mean a lot and you get each other. You never talk yeah. about that to your, uh, the adults in your world. No. So help me understand it a bit and help the kind of the adults who are listening to this. Like, how do they support their young people during lockdown? Like, what do you guys need? I'm asking you to speak well, on behalf of all teams, but yeah, I mean, so from my my own personal experiences and from what I've seen from other people, the best way I would say to go around is, you know, for the parent to acknowledge that they understand that their child is going through something that perhaps they don't want to talk about, to respect the fact that they don't want to talk about it and to not push them to talk about it trust that they'll come to the the parent when they're ready to speak about it and don't go like over the top trying to make sure that everything is okay because that could just become really overwhelming because sometimes if you know a parent is going like way over the top to try and include or make someone laugh or just make them feel happy especially when all they want is just time to themselves that can get really, really overwhelming and you can sort of drown in the social pressure in your own home. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a real intensity to what you say there because while the parents overcompensate, it actually pushes the young person further away. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's... Also it's, it's, all a, it's like a game of chess. You know, you've got to... It's like if, if a game of chess was played in reverse, you've got to open up opportunities for the other person to move in when they're ready. You, just you, you can never, you should never force someone to speak about, you know, something that's troubling them. You, the best thing you can do for them is to let them know that you're there for them when they're ready. Yeah, I love that because you're giving people, really, you're giving them the space is what you said before, but you're actually giving them space in so many different ways. I really like how you have phrased that, um, Connor. And it also kind of gives me hope because I think so often we give every generation a bad press about something. And the young people get this generational kind of bashing, don't they, of wokeness, of... Yeah. Um, not working and it's this whole lost generation thing and and actually what you're highlighting for me is that actually most of you got your head switched on you are talking to each other so help me a little bit more um as a 16 17 18 year old these are really important years you talked about kind of the lack of social interaction and how hard that was especially now in winter what about growth and development, college, work? I mean, you've been through quite a few changes as well during, you know, the lockdown process. T tell yeah. me a little bit about the changes, how you made those decisions and, and what work is like in, in, in kind of the lockdown world. I mean, so I was definitely contemplating dropping out of college way before any of us knew that this pandemic was, you know, was going to get as serious as it, as it was. and. To be honest, I'm happy that I did drop out of college because the main reason I had was because I, I didn't like the subjects that I chose. Um, so I dropped out, decided to do my own thing and pursue a career in, well, what I'm doing at the moment is freelance journalism and trying to get myself out there. And um, it's tough. 
uh, is, is, the, is the easiest way to put it. Because journalism on its own is a very, very hard area to, you know, get into. Uh, there's, there's minimal openings and opportunities. And if you pair that with a national lockdown and pan, like international pandemic, where all work is now remote, you can't exactly go out and explore. It's not like there's particularly anything to report live on. It's not like, you know, when Kate Aidy was in a battlefield somewhere in, you know, wherever she was reporting. It's all around us, but it's nothing that we can visually report on. We can only report on how far the government is getting over and over and over again. So, I mean, for me, it gives, to be fair, it gives me a lot of time. Like I've made a website, I've started promoting a lot more. It's given me an opportunity to really push myself to the next level, which I would not be able to do if I was still at college, let alone studying the right college courses. And, you know, for my friends currently studying, I think the, the idea of remote learning is not practical. I mean, I understand it's the best we can do at the moment, but it's, it's not the best way for anyone to take in information because, you know, I, when you're in a school setting, you're in, an, you're in the right environment and headspace to learn and take in information and teachers can cater to your specific needs and learning type. Whereas if you're learning remotely, everyone is dealt with the same way because there's such a lack of resources because they can't exactly distribute every single resource that everyone needs for a practical science experiment to every single house across the UK. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's more like, it's not ideal. It'll do, but it's not a long-term solution. So, um, it's tough as well because there's the whole, you know, going back to school debate. I think, you know, remote learning is the best we can do at the moment. Well, but I, I think that when you're, you know, at home taking a lesson in your bed or, you know, in your pajamas, you are not in the right mindset to take in any information. I love the... I think that that'll impact the, the exams or the equivalent of exams and a future of career potentially. Yeah. You may just not be equipped enough in the field. I loved how you referenced uh, Kate Ad before. That's like a real nod to my generation of journalists. I've been reading quite a few uh, journalism books. She's uh, she was a, a real beacon of light, actually, for female journalists, not just journalists. Yeah, well, she was she was amazing. She created opportunities for so many new people. Yeah, and really, she she forged away as a as a, a female reporter early on. Actually, she was uh, she reported on the um, Iranian embassy uh, SAS sort of takeover as well. Yeah. It was very exciting. I've done my own research on it, like obviously, but um, to hear it from her words in uh, the Kindness of Strangers, amazing book. To hear it from her words of how she transition from this kid growing up I think it was Sunderland I might have forgotten I think it was Sunderland to then becoming this you know worldwide reporter in Istanbul wherever there was a war going on she was there yeah, sure. risking her life and somehow you know just came out of it and ready to do it again yeah 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 it was uh, definitely her story is worth is worth reading um so look come come back to this idea of of working you talk about it, it being tough you're now uh, pushing your own development as a journalist and starting out on your career how does somebody who doesn't have all the connections how do you make connections when you're living in a pandemic world of lockdown i mean how does it work <laughs> Connor? it's tough i don't have the connections so i i decided to start to work I decided to work from the ground up. So I contacted a local magazine because I've done, I'm a big part of the community here in my, in my little village. You know, uh, 
half the people here know by name, the other half know by face. Yeah. So um, I think everyone here who's doing their own thing is looking for publicity. Like there's there's um market in minds going on, which is anti-suicide because earlier on in the year we lost three young men to suicide. So um, a really kind-hearted woman decided to start the charity, and now that I am in the position to give a platform however big however small i was given the opportunity to write about her that gives me a contact and it also gives her a contact for you know if one of us gets to more mainstream opportunities so the way i did it is i started from the ground up i then contacted another magazine saying i'm a regular writer for this magazine and it doesn't always work. You know, I've tried to contact uh, Varolinian Radio, you know, the Watford Observer, I think it was. And it, it's tough. But there are so many different publications out there that statistically it's almost impossible for you to fail if you keep on going, in, in my field at least. I Well, I, you know, I think that kind of working your backside off you know, nothing is easy. Anything really worth getting is you're going to have to work towards. And I remember seeing, uh, I think it was a, a year since Kobe Bryant died this week. And I was yeah. watching a video of his where he was saying, you know, if you see me driving around in a sports car or you see me in a seven star hotel, don't be jealous of me. I've worked my ass off to get here. And I think, you know, there's that element of actually, if you put in the hours, you can become an expert in your field. And that's when you'll be really recognized and valued. Now, that might take five years, 10 years, 20 years, but it's getting all the hours in. So the more hours you put in now, the more you become that kind of 10,000 hour expert that allows you to be able to deal with most things. Um, yeah. Do you go into writing your own um, magazine so you can put your own stories in there or do you have to look? I mean, I've, others? I've thought about it. It's a lot of work yeah. to create and publish a magazine all by myself as well. Mm. And then it's work to get it published in shops for sale. And I feel like a person of my... A person who... To be to be honest, lacks as much experience as I do at the moment because I've been doing this for just around a year now. So for a person who has a minimal experience, that's hard to do. So at the moment, that's definitely not my best option or my easiest option. Yeah, yeah. So to, uh, to get where I want to go, I think. It and would... Also, I'm still learning. You know, I'm I'm doing courses on journalism to find out more and more and more. And I'm taking notes on these courses and I'm revising these notes and I'm rewriting those notes so they really stick in my brain. Yeah. Clearly it's tapped into a real passion of yours. Yeah, I, I love it. You know, I've, um, back in like secondary school, you know, year seven and eight, I was awful uh, writing. And then the moment I knew that I actually, I had a lot of you know, self-confidence issues back then. And the moment I realised I was actually good at something is I went home, I put in the hours and I submitted an essay for my English teacher. This was in year nine. And she was, she told like my entire class, she was marking it in front of a year eight class. And she just started crying. Wow. And to me, you know, because English was something I always wanted to be good at. It, it was more the creative factor that I loved of it. I could do whatever I want. It's a blank page. And to kind of have that impact on the person who, in my eyes at the time, knew it all, was incredible for me. And that was the time where I was like, okay, i got to keep going with this. And then I, I got a good set of GCSE results, took all the wrong A-level subjects and decided to just go my own way which was definitely not the easiest way yeah but it's the way i've chosen now i'm not going to back down just because it's going to be a bit harder 
No, nor should you, right? And I think you have tapped into this sort of talent and passion you have. I wonder, what is it about journalism? Is it the investigative side? Is it, is it the telling the story side? What, what bits of it are you attracted to? I enjoy the research side of it. I enjoy the storytelling side of it. Mm-hmm. But for me, the best part of it is to write down what I've, you know, to finish a first draft. And I look at that first draft and I look, what can be improved? And I'll improve those, you know, changes. And then I'll improve those improvements. And then I'll show my mum or someone, she'll go, improve that, that, and that, because obviously I'm still learning. And then I'll improve that, that, and that. And then I'll improve this, that, and this. And then I look at it and I go, that's my best work. And that is, that's the bit I'm in love with. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose there's a real way of getting, of creating connection for people through words. Words are so yeah. important. And the order of words is so important. Um, let's change uh, tack a bit. Um, how have you been unwinding then during lockdown? You've obviously seen your mates from time to time. You've clearly been working on building out your career. Um, so yeah. how have you been unwinding? How, when you're stuck at home the whole time, how do you find and get that balance between life and work? <laughs> I mean, I would say I'm, my day-to-day routine on the weekdays is I wake up at 9.30, do work and just like you know important stuff until four o'clock and then do whatever I want and after that I rely on social interaction to make up for the lack of physical interaction so I will spend from nine from four o'clock sorry until about 11 o'clock constantly talking to people you know I'll be at an Xbox party I'll be on FaceTime you know, I'll be texting people, Snapchatting, you know, and um, that is how I keep myself stimulated when I'm not doing, you know, the work side of my life at the moment. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, when it's my day to take the dog out on a walk, I'll, you know, put in the chat, someone come on a dog walk with me and someone will go, you know, yeah, sure, I'll come with you, mate. And then I'll have a nice hour's chat with, you know, whoever decides to come on a dog walk with me. And then we'll just go our separate ways. And that's my physical interaction for the week. Yeah. Well, I did exactly the same, actually, to your mother uh, on Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I'm going to be in Marquette walking Rocky. Do you want to join me, Pets? <laughs> no, yeah, she, she told me. So um, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it, that every generation is having to do the same thing, like literally grab an hour with someone walking the dog. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, it, it's annoying because, you know, my my sports of choice, you can tell because I'm a skinny little boy, <laughs> but my sports of choice, I do do sports, are, you know, football and skateboarding. Yeah. And football is a hard sport to play when there's two people. <laughs> you know, it, you can pass the ball back and forth. You know, the wreck up here doesn't have nets at the moment, so it's a lot of running. Yeah. And I can't skate in the wet because I'll just I'll fall on my face every time. <laughs> it, it's stupid, slippery. I can't do anything. So, although if you can, find, um, if you I'm could, not I'm not a runner. If you could find a small confined space, one-on-one football could be quite good fun. It could be fun, but then what do you do about social distancing? Well, it's almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I, I'm not a runner. I don't enjoy walking. So at at the moment, my hours exercise a week is walking the dog or, you know, walking to the shop. Do you feel more sedentary not playing football? I don't know what sedentary means. Uh, Just like more lazy, more slow, more sluggish. Yeah, you know, um, you know, playing football with the boys was a massive part of my everyday life. You know, when the weather was good, even when the weather was was rubbish, we'd go out, play at least three, four hours of football a day, come back, have a shower, and then just talk to them for the rest of the day. So without the physical stimulation that I once had, it's 
hard to find proper motivation. Yeah. And what have you noticed? I've just... Oh, sorry. Go on, finish. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I've got to keep pushing myself to say, you know, one day this will all be worth it. And one day I'll, I'll catch the big break. And one day I'll, I'll have managed to... All that work that I will have done will have gone towards making my career. Should I... Should I have one if I could be so lucky? Connor, what you focus on grows. Full stop, end of story. I mean, it's a mantra for me in, in all walks of my life, personal and professional. What you focus on will grow. Um, and you would have even heard me say that before, right? No, I've heard you say that. <laughs> and, and it's true. And I think the more you focus on this, the more it will grow. And the online space is very welcoming to new publications. Uh, Facebook and Insta give us a huge opportunity yeah. to speak to a wider audience. And it is about self-promotion and that can be uncomfortable too, a little bit, right? Um, yeah. But get out there and talk to every single one of your uncles and aunties and mum and dad friends yeah. and everybody. I've been can. there. I've done all of that. Right. Yeah. That. <laughs> it's like, who can you put me in front of? Just have a little think because it's just about connections. And maybe you yeah. can connect with someone who's really good at publishing and do something with them. There's so many opportunities to collaborate. Out. Yeah. I mean, the editor of the Market Monthly, he's been unbelievably helpful. You know, um, like with um, if I ask him for a bit of advice on a topic, he will send me, you know, a, a lecture or a, a collection of lectures that he wrote himself back when he was, you know, in, in a similar position to me. Wow. And that's that's really helpful. So he's been unbelievably helpful. He's been kind of the guy that has he's given me a, a big leg up. Yeah. I'm very thankful for that because he's, he's taken it out of his own time just because I asked him to. Right. Which gives and you... that kind of kindness is, is really nice to see. I love that. Um, and I also think what's really nice is, you know, karma has a way of coming around, right? So you're getting that because of something you've done. He'll get that paid, paid forward to him. I'd like to hope so. Yeah. For doing it. Um, Okay, so my last question then uh, in our conversation, Connor, I want to bring it back into um, the fact that you've been at home for nearly 11 months now. Um, you live with other people and, and they're all going through their own lockdowns. So what have you learned about yourself living with your family during these last strange 11 months? I need my own space. <laughs> you know I've, I've got my bedroom but when i'm cooped up in you know this house with three sometimes four other people because mm. um the stepsister comes over every weekend as well yeah when i'm when i'm cooped up with these three or four other people all day every day seeing them at the exact same times to do the exact same stuff yeah we drive each other up the walls like it's, it, it's mental and obviously there's been arguments as you know you everyone has experienced and anticipated but um i mean we all managed to work past it because we're a family and you know we're in a worldwide pandemic yeah. you know we're all stuck at home but we're family and at the end of the day we love each other so whatever disagreements we have we can work past because we're in such a position that the love we have for each other is more in, is is capable of bypassing the negative emotional effects that this pandemic is bringing upon us that's a, a lovely reflection what a nice reflection on your family because you're right there's a there's a truth to that right we drive each other mad but the love extends yeah. beyond it uh, what's been like your funniest moment in the family over the last 10 months like what one thing really stands out that made you wet yourself like you were like yeah now that is funny i would say just 
dinner time. Right. Because, you know, if if everything just clicks, everything, everyone is in a good enough mood, we have some amazing conversations, some brilliant laughs, you know, it might help if John's been drinking a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, dinner times, you know, the times where we all come and sit down together, yeah. share a meal that, you know, any one of us could have cooked and just have a bit of a laugh. I like that. So it's actually f- family time. And you're right, when, we, when everybody's on form in the right moment, that one hour, what used to be like 20 minutes eat and go, suddenly becomes an hour because actually people are really enjoying having a nice conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, back before, because I'm, um, back before the pandemic, because I used to have plans all day, every day, I would come home for dinner. Sometimes I would come home, just have it when I got home, eat my dinner, wait for mum to finish, which, you know, can take hours sometimes. <laughs> Put all the plates in the dishwasher, say thank you, maybe, you know, have a shower or something if, you know, even uh, playing football in the mud or something and just go back out. Yeah. <laughs> but now it gives me this real opportunity to connect with my family because I've got no other plans. And it kind of sounds like I was putting them as a second priority, but in, in past Connor's mind, that was okay because I lived with them. I think it's now... Our connection is stronger than it ever has been purely because I live with them. Yeah. And that's not something that I would change really. Yeah, I like if it. I if I had the opportunity to move out with a few friends months ago, in the moment I would have taken it and I'd have looked back and I said, that was a shit decision, Carl. What are you doing? Yeah. But I'm I'm happy that I've got this family. Well, like, they'll like listening to that. I think that'll make them. I was going to say, I'm going to get you to clip the last 10 minutes and just send it to mom. I think she'll love that. I'll just do a little recording of it later and send it to <laughs> Um She'll be like, she won't know whether to cry or smile. Um, Connor, I think that's great. I, I think that if you've helped me understand something, what you've really helped me understand today is that the feeling side of being a team today has been so kind of magnified by the lack of physical contact that actually for parents listening to this, there's a real sensitive balance to, between being a parent and caring for that young person and giving them the yeah. space to grow and experience and feel. And I think it's always easier when it's not your kids, right? Um, yeah. So, so I'm sure I know that to be true. Um, yeah, I mean, well, sometimes I, parents will go like, "What?" Parents will go like, "What's wrong?" Yeah. And the person that's old to just just won't know. They're just having an off day, and they'll say, "I don't know." And the parent will be like, "No, it's okay. You can talk to me." And they'll go, <laughs> "I don't know what's wrong." And they'll go, "No, no, it's cool. You know, I'm I'm here. You can talk to me. You can talk to me." Just pressuring them. And, yeah. you know, what I've done, if that happens, is just make something up. Right. So I'm not too deep, but something that I can just not have to talk to anyone for a little bit before. Right. So you actually buy yourself some downtime by just feeding a line to get them to stop. Getting... A little white lie. Yeah, yeah. Well, a line rather than a lie even. It's just a line. It's probably true. Yeah. Not the biggest issue, but it keeps them But quiet. sometimes people just forget that. Some people just don't want to talk. Mm. And that's that's okay. You're a natural empath, Connor. You you, feel deeply what others feel. How have you coped with being an empath during such a difficult, sustained period of time? I would split it into two different um, scenarios the first one with the boys the boys can be ruthless you know the, the group of friends were always chatting rubbish about each other so I think for me and a few others in the group we can we can see when it's going too far dial it back ourselves maybe fire a few shots the other way just to maybe keep it even or just to 
kill the argument or conversation or whatever it is. And then afterwards, just check up, make sure the person's feeling better, feeling okay. And if we did the right thing, especially. And then with the family, it's easy to lose your temper with the people that you've been in the same house with for around a year now, you know, just with limited interaction with other people. So it can be hard not to lose your temper. I felt it going so many times. I've just had to, I've, I've pictured it inside myself. I've just had to hold it back and go, now is not the time. Don't be stupid. Yeah. I, I think you're sharing a story others will empathize <laughs> with. Um, they really will. Um, and Connor, what's your hope as you look forward? Final question, I promise. What's your hope <laughs> as we look forward? It's, it's a hard question. Because oh, it, it can span over so many various different topics and fields of discussion. But my hope is that everything goes back to normal within a suitable amount of time. You know, we won't have to spend the rest of our lives going out of face masks and social distancing because that's no way to live. Yeah. It's a way to live to, present, to prevent something worse from happening in the short term or the long term. It's no way to live out the rest of your life. So I hope we can go back to normal. Yeah. That's, that's the bare minimum for me. Well, I echo that and we'll put that out into the universe. <laughs> Connor Gill, thank you for joining the lockdown sessions. Will you come back again? Thank you for inviting me. I would love to. Thank you for yeah. inviting me on. And I think what we can do is maybe we should uh, clip this whole thing and you could start editing out and doing some self-promotion of your own uh, <laughs> on a podcast and promote that journalistic career. Anybody listening? I'll, to I'll definitely promote it for you as well. Um, Connor, what a, what a delight. Uh, thank you for joining us and I'll see you, but well, I will, I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much, Brad. Nice to see you.